Buongiorno, sono consapevole che la giornata volge al finire, ma eh, abbiamo un ospite di prestigio e quindi vi invito a prendere posto. Fa anche un po' meno caldo adesso. Ok, so I will move to English, so Daiva can also understand what I'm telling you. Uh, Professor Daiva uh, Dokantaite is uh, from the University of Lund. She's professor of psychology, and uh, her uh, primary expertise uh, is in uh, uh, research methods. And uh, this is also uh, clear from the title and the contents of the presentation she's going uh, to, uh, to talk about. Uh, we have met uh, the first time 15 years ago during the Italian, uh, the, the European Conference of Positive Psychology that took place in Italy. And since then we have been in touch, uh, and I must say, um, I have always really, really admired uh, her works uh, in terms of research, but uh, most, more recently I also had the opportunity of uh, appreciate uh, her amazing uh, uh, commitment uh, and, uh, ex and uh, um, competence uh, uh, as uh, an associate uh, editor of the Journal of Happiness Studies. Uh, so, um, I think we can uh, start listening to Daiva, and thank you. thank you for coming. Thank you. Hello to everybody, and thank you, Antonella, for such nice words. You know, it's like I'm, I feel really embarrassed. It's not so nice to listen uh, about uh, myself, like from a very famous professor. Uh, today, uh, as Antonella said, I, I'm associate professor in psychology, and uh, you know, it's like my, my interest is in, in uh, positive psychology. I defended my thesis about subject well-being, and but I also like statistical statistics and methodology, and I teach advanced statistics and methodology. So it's like a good combination, I think. It's it's always a good combination to know some methodology when you are a researcher. So today I, I present my title is about different paths to flourishing and uh, I present different operationalizations of flourishing and also illustrate some uh, illustrate some results from my own research. So, as you all know, there are different definitions of mental health and well-being in general. So, but the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So in this definition is like a social contribution, social, social functioning and individual function emphasizes, emphasized. However, hedonic well-being is also important and it's like combination of both hedonic and, uh, and eudaimonic well-being is refers to flourishing. And Probably all of you would agree that it is, flourishing is a de desirable condition that all communities would benefit from endorsing it among their citizens. However, as always, there are a number of problems. There is no unanim unanimous definition and operationalization of flourishing. And different components are considered as key components in measuring flourishing. And this complicates comparisons of the results among different studies and also complicates the conclusions that we, uh, that probably are very important for policymakers. So short outline of my presentation today, some of the main operationalizations of flourishing and their psychometric properties in the psychology literature. And I also like different paths as I will come to this 
this sentence several times during my presentation about different paths to flourishing, how it, did, how it affects how we measure it, so the prevalence of flourishing using different operationalizations, and also, I, as I said, I will present a list illustrative picture using the results of my project. So, when you read the literature, you, you can find different definitions of well-being, mental health, and also flourishing. However, probably there are four main uh, operationalizations that I, I, I think all of you have seen in different articles, in different, in different context. So Key's operational, operational definition, mental health continuum, is his operational, operational definition is probably one of the oldest, like he's, he presented 2002. Then is Hubert and So's operational definition in the European Social Survey and Diener's operational definition of the flourishing scale and Seligman's operational definition, the PERMA model and the PERMA profile. I will go, uh, go and I will describe these uh, four operationalizations more in detail and we'll start with Key's operational definition. So mental health is best viewed according to, to, to Key's operational, operational definition as consisting of the presence and the absence of mental health and mental illness. So he presented the two continuum model. So it's like flourishing to languishing and absence to presence pathology. So according to his, uh, his it's like coexistence of both. It's flourishing can coexist with psychopathology. Uh, the so theoretical guide for the, he started to think about like that you can diagnose mental health, not only diagnose uh, major depression. So he used like a theoretical guide, statistical diagnostic, statistical manual, and uh, he chose like this. It, it was his his guide to to define uh, flourishing to choose the aspects of uh, flourishing that he used in his uh, definition. Also, this theoretical guide, uh, theoretical ground is, uh, I would say it was not so, it was unusual. However, the measure of his, of his uh, flourishing of his mental health continuum is underpinned by three theoretical um, origins. So Diener studies of subjective well-being and the keys call it emotional well-being. Riff studies on psychology, psychological well-being, as you know, like Riff and Keys co-work co and it developed um, Riff's psychological well-being measure and also his own key studies on uh, on uh, his own studies on social well-being so key's approach required the combined presence of high emotional well-being psychological well-being and social well-being and uh, it's, if it's uh, possible to see so this mental health continuum consists of 14 items and as 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 I said, like it was opposing, he said like, we, we can diagnose mental health. And he said, as diagnosing like um, depression, you do not need to, patients do not need to endorse all items, all symptoms in this, in, uh, listed in the diagnostic manual. So he says uh, the same with mental health, like if to be like categorized or diagnosed as mental health or flourish, you have to endorse uh, one of three items of emotional well-being, six of uh, 11 items on uh, psychological and social well-being. So, and you, you have to endorse five or six, so almost every day or, or every day. So it's like a uh, factor analysis, uh, numerous, m lots of studies have been published studying like validity and reliability of this measure and it's, it's, it looks really, you know, it's like I cannot see any problems. It is problematic. We use for children and if it, even if it's, there is a, a published study using 
Portuguese children. We couldn't, we, we tried to adapt this measure and we used for children. It, they, they didn't understand the questions, especially regarding social well-being. It was too complicated. So I do not know, I, I'm really, I'm not sure if we can use this measure for children, if, even if we adapt this, this one a lot. So prevalence rates, when you look at prevalence rates, when you use this, using mental health continuum, it's like from 8% among Korean adults to 49% among uh, US college, uh, college students. And you know, it's like many different problems, like it, there are cultural differences, and we know all that it's like it's a huge difference, it's cultural differences, but it's also sampling problems. Like, you know, it's like sometimes, as you see, like it's Egyptian adolescents, like, and then it's like adults, and adult is definition. What is adult? Like, it's different definitions I use. Like, students are also adults, but it's, it's again, it's like a special, special sample. So, huge variance of, of prevalence rates of flourishing using mental health. And in my uh, old study, I found about 17% of flourishing among Swedish students. Hubert and Soss operational definition, similar to, uh, to uh, Keith's uh, theoretical ground, uh, Hubert and Soss also decided to use like these uh, clinical manuals so and try to identify a list of positive features opposing symptoms of mental health mental illnesses so depression and anxiety and it's interesting in, in this they moved further and they did not only use the instruments to define the theoretical ground but they also used to find these 10 positive features. So it's competence, emotional stability, engagement, meaning, optimism, positive emotion, positive relationships, resilience, self-esteem, and vitality. And also uh, statistical, statistically, they, uh, they analyzed an exploratory factor analysis revealed the presence of three factors, positive characteristics, positive functioning, and positive appraisal. And it's again similar to, to, to Keith's uh, idea. They said they, the participants, the individuals, do not need to endorse all items uh, to be in high scores on all items. So four out of five items of positive characteristics, three out of four items on positive functioning, and the present, this uh, positive appraisal should be present if you are flourish, flourishing. So, and if you look just at this positive emotion that it's called positive emotions, it also raises ideas how we cannot agree on the same, like uh, uh, Hubert and Soss call a positive emotion, but it's, it's more like a global measurement of life satisfaction or global measurement of of yeah, life satisfaction, how, how happy you would you say you are. So it's, it's again like, you know, different labels, but when you look at the content of the measures, it's lots of similar things. And probably Hubert and Soss made the largest study. It's like, I don't know if anybody could could compare to this, 43 respondents participated from 22 countries participated in this, in this, uh, in the sur survey. So on average, 16% of Europeans were flourishing, and you know, it's like Denmark was leading in flourishing. Okay, we live very close to Denmark. Maybe they are so flourish. And Portugal was like one of the like least flourishing, languishing or least flourishing people. Sweden says like 23%. Italy is, on, is not, did not participate. You do not care probably, you know, it's like you are flourishing. 
So, and it's again, as you know, it's like if you study, it's like huge differences were found between Northern Europe, Southern Europe, and Eastern Europe, like when the blocks of Europe were compared to each other. And even, you know, it's like I couldn't find any specified studies like uh, studying like reliability and validity, but what Hubert and So reported, it's like it's it's again, it's reliable and valid instrument to measure. What is different from, from Key's um, application that Hubert emphasized that we, we should look not only at number of flourishing people or languishing people, but we should look and uh, analyze profile of flourishing. So here are three different profiles and Spain and United Kingdom is, I'll see if I... So Spain and United Kingdoms, uh, they had very similar scores, total scores on, on this instrument. However, the profiles were rather different. So uh, Hubert emphasized that we should look at different pillars, different components of, uh, of uh, uh, flourishing and help in that case we could help people to, to be better, to improve their mental health. What I see as a problem that oh, they have 10 different key components, but they measure these components by single items. And it's again, you all probably know like that it's, it's huge problems. But, but we cannot trust sing, like re reliable, in most cases, sometimes they are reliable, but you know, it's like single items in most cases are not reliable measures. So it's, yeah, it's good to look at multidimensional and different components, but at the same time, we have to be very cautious to make broad conclusions. Diener's operational definition, I would say that probably he, his definition uh, lies closest to, to my, because I, I defended my thesis about subjective well-being, and you know, I, I read Diener a lot, like I read about, I read Diener's work, and, but his definition, his operational definition is completely different from, Theoretical ground is completely different from Keyes and Hubert's um, definitions because uh, Diener and colleagues conceptualize flourishing as the fulfillment, fulfillment of the needs of competence, relatedness, and self-acceptance, -accept as, uh, as well as possession of psychological capital, such as flowing and engagement. So they did not use DSM or other manuals to, to find the, the components, of, but they base partly upon earlier humanistic psychology as theories. So the aspects of well-being that Diener and his colleagues chose to include in the new measure of flourishing is meaning and purpose, supportive and rewarding relationships, engagement and interested, contribution to the well-being of others, competence, self-acceptance, optimism, and being respected. So these, and it's like, it's again, it's eight item measure, short. It's good to have with other measures. And Diener did not provide any thresholds for flourishing. And this instrument is mostly used as in addition to other instruments. So uh, in an article by Hohn that I will present a bit later, uh, they suggested an arbitrary cutoff points. And uh, so this arbitrary cut cutoff points are 48 points, 48 scores or higher. If, you score, if your scores are 48 or higher, you could be categorized as flourishing. But it's, as I said, like a Diener did not provide any, any cutoff scores. So it's again a number of different studies confirmed the validity, reliability, and invariant of one factor structure. So it's always like many, many people I'm interested to look at, to use the instruments and to test reliability and, and, 
and validity of the instruments. So it's also where, as expected, negative correlations were found with different negative aspects of mental health, as anxiety and, for example, depression. And Seligman's theory of a human flourishing builds upon his conceptualization of authentic happiness with two new additions, additions, positive relationships and accomplishments. So it's like he, how to say, rethink his authentic model of happiness and suggested it as the PERMA model including five different pillars of flourishing. So positive emotion, engagement in life and work, positive relationships, meaning in life and work, and accomplishments. And it was like uh, this book that Martin Seligman, uh, in the book he presented his new model or he, he revised an enlarged model of flourishing. Uh, and Butler and Kern, two, two researchers, developed the PERMA profiler. So it's like uh, they did really, I think, would be a, an example of how to, how to, do, to work with, to develop a new, a new instrument. So the numerous theoretically relevant items were compiled to create the measure and then tested in different samples, different age, and, uh, and three experts in positive psychology also looked at, at the items and how important they are and so on. So, and these, uh, so it resulted in 16 items. 15 items, so it's three items per every component, and in addition, general well being item. So, no any theoretical uh, thresholds for categorical diagnosis of flourishing. They did not, uh, but the three scores of each component are averaged to produce a component score. So, they emphasize that they are not interested in, in general, uh, on like categorizing flourishing, like to categorize, to diagnose flourishing people, but at the same time emphasize that there are different five main pillars, five main components, and to be like flourishing, you have to be high on all. And they also, similar to, to uh, Hooper and so, emphasize it, that it's it's more important to look at profiles, not only not on the sum of the scores for this PERMA profiler. And this uh, is like, as I presented, five different pillars uh, like were measured by this the PERMA profiler, and the two negative emotions and physical health were measured by additional uh, additional items. And it's interesting, you know, it's like. Uh, Seligman developed this PERMA model, but already when other researchers developed a measure to, 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 to a measure, an uh, instrument to measure this PERMA, PERMA model, they probably ident identified that there are some more pillars that are missing in this PERMA model. So that we need probably more like items, more items, more things to, to measure. And even in this PERMA profile, there is no, uh, loneliness is not, I, I don't know why they did not, did not include in this profile, but they also measure, have a, um, an, an, an item measuring loneliness. So it's difficult to see in this uh, table, but it's like kind of summary of all these four different conceptualizations of uh, operation, operationalizations of flourishing. And uh, as you see, rather different list of the key components are included in, in all these uh, operationalizations. And to my, probably it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, it's like when you, for example, Keys and Hooper use the same DSM measure, how to, 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 to define flourishing, 
use the same theoretical ground, but if you look at how, uh, what pillars, what key components are included, they are rather different. So, and uh, again, there is an agreement on at least two matters, that flourishing is a multidimensional, surprise, <laughs> construct, and uh, that flourishing refers to high levels of hedonic, uh, eudaimonic levels of well-being. And even Diener did not include any, any aspects of, uh, like, uh, 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 hedonic well-being. However, this instrument, he suggested to use a flourishing scale together with his satisfaction with life scale and positive and negative uh, scale that he also developed. So it's a it's very interesting study uh, in Ho Hohn and uh, her colleagues published in 2014, and they had a very, it's a huge uh, data set, about 10,000 participants, uh, data from 10,000 participants, so on average they are 44 years old, and they compared prevalence rates of flourishing using different models, so they had items that could resemble the all four models that I presented. And it's very interesting that the same sample, so it's like if you, if you look at Keyes model, so it's according to Keyes model, 39% of those adults could be, could be categorized as flourishing. According to Hubert and Sow's model, so it's 24%. 41% met the criteria for flourishing according to Diener's model and 47 according to the PERMA model. So the same people like you, you could be flourishing and I hope not languishing, just like using different measures of flourishing. And they also, uh, compared percentage of agreement and experiments correlation for different operationalizations of flourishing. And if you see Seligman's and Keys, like if you categorized or like diagnosed as flourishing according to Seligman and Keys, so it's like it's rather high agreement, 81% of agreement using those two. And rather high agreement if you use Diener's and Seligman's uh, operationalizations. A bit lower uh, agreement was found between Hubert and Sow's models and uh, the other ones. So, uh, back to different paths to flourishing. So, it could be like these paths go via different instruments. So, I it probably doesn't matter for us if, I, I don't know, I wouldn't matter. It, it wouldn't be a problem for me if I'm uh, categorized as flourishing or languishing or mentally, moderately mentally healthy. But it's, it is important if we, if we present our results for policymakers that we have to, to these results have to be valid. That, and to be close to our, to the reality, what it, it is. And I, I will, different paths to flourishing, the second part I will provide an illustrative picture based on my own data. And this, I hope that you wouldn't be scared because it's a bit like, it's more negative, it's not so positive project. It's about self-harm, and it's 10, ten years follow-up. It's a longitudinal project, and, and the title of this project is like, what happens to young adults who have engaged in self-harm as adolescents? So, so the first data collection was 2007, and, to, uh, and then the second, 2008, when uh, adolescents were 14 and 15 years old. And, uh, 10 years later, now they are about 25 years, no, not now, it's like two years ago, they were 25 years old. And the main idea 10 years ago to study self-harm and other psycho, psycho, 
psychological distress, distress among young adults, adolescents with the focus on interpe interpersonal relations and emotion regulation. So at that time, we, they, I was not involved in the project 10 years ago, but they did not have a special, like a real measures of life satisfaction or flourishing. 10 years later, I, uh, when now I am responsible for this project. I use both uh, Diener's scale of flourishing and Diener's scale of life satisfaction. And just shortly about self-harm, that it, it refers to direct, deliberate destruction of one's own body tissue. So the most popular way of self-harming is cutting the wrists, the arms. And speaking in middle, in mid uh, adolescence, the main function of self harm is affect regulation. Individuals engage in self harm to release tension and manage emotional pain. And self harm declines. To, uh, however, repetitive self harm is in adolescence strongly predicts future self harm, suicide attempts, and other psychological problems. So. Uh, Ten years ago, we had about 1,000 participants, and two years ago, almost 50% of them completed our survey. So we did attrition analysis very properly, compared if we, if we got a special sample now, we did find some significant differences, but all differences had very low effect sizes. None of the effect sizes were like higher than small. So it's like I was rather happy to say that it's probably shows like a co community sample. Uh, it's like it's a, a good picture, a good subsample of our original uh, community sample. And it just to, to look at like you, you, it's every fifth uh, girl reported at, uh, repetitive self-harm in adolescence, and as expected, the self-harm uh, decreased in young adulthood. And we looked at uh, different patterns, you know, it's like how it's like self-harm, like, uh, and thanks God, like the largest sample we found and if you look, about 70% did not report any self-harm, uh, any repetitive self-harm, not at any time points. Then it's like in uh, about 5%, I think it's now based on other information, it is a clinical sample now. We ask about diagnosis and so it's like a clinical sample. Then we found two, two subgroups that that reported rather high self-harm in adolescence, but no self-harm in, in, in adulthood. And a small sample, so a small subgroup that reported uh, like new cases of self-harm. So research question, are there significant differences in flourishing and life satisfaction in young adulthood between those with different repetitive self-harm trajectories? Yes, of course, <laughs> but, but what was unexpected, yes, we have found significant differences among those five, but we found that those who did not report uh, self-harm in adulthood, they like built kind of cluster. We did not find it, they, they reported rather similar levels of flourishing, even if they really had different background, different, different like um, uh, psychological health 10 years, 10 years before. And similar was found for those who, who continue self-harm. So they reported lowest level of flourishing. Similar results were found for satisfaction with life. It's again two clusters like self-harm, no, no self-harm. And I, 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 I said, maybe it should be some differences. And you know, it's like I decided, even if uh, Dina did not suggest it to look at different, as like Hooper and, Co uh, and so, look different pillars of, uh, of uh, flourishing, I tr 
I looked at profiles and maybe I tried to find maybe, you know, it's like some pillars of that are lower, but it's, I couldn't see any differences. Like, you know, it's like, it's a bit lower, but it's not like it, that you have to work on this uh, aspect or that aspect. So, and then looking at it and more clothes are like flourishing and life satisfaction, it's like differences are, non-significant and effect size is very low. Yes, those who did not report any self-harm report a bit higher, but you know, it's like no significant differences. But when I, we looked at negative aspects um, and aspects of mental illness, we did find uh, differences on depression and anxiety, and also on emotion dysregulation that is in most cases related to self-harm. But, and you know, it's like, it's even, you know, 10 years later, those people who had probably rather dysfunctional coping strategies, they still have problems coping with distress compared to those who didn't, did not have any problems. And it's again, we, we, we thought maybe we need even more information, and we interviewed the participants from different subgroups. And the, the number in the table are like from different, uh, the, the, how many interviewed from different uh, clusters of self-harm. And I will focus on those who did not report any self-harm, but reported self-harm in, in childhood in adult, adolescence. Interesting that 11 participants who we interviewed, only four uh, acknowledged that they had ever harmed themselves. It's, you know, it's like for me, quantitative researcher, I said, okay, can I trust my, my quantitative data now? Like, you know, it's like it's less than than 50% who acknowledged, but they all acknowledged they, that they had lived a difficult life in adolescence. And you know, when you listen to these interviews, it's again these two worlds, what we define, what we as researchers define self-harm, what we as researchers define as well-being, and what participants, what patients define as self-harm. So from their stories, we could say, okay, but it's, it's, it is a destructive behavior that we define as self-harm. So, and this analysis is made by, by Benjamin Clareus, it's a PhD student in the project, and what he really identified, he summarized in, in this, that it was low well-being, it's really, it's, it shows like none of the stories give much hope from the adolescents. So, but he identified that it's like a turning point. Sometimes this turning point is already in adolescence. But sometimes the, the, he, uh, Benjamin, when he listened to this interview said, it, it, it was like to move from the school. I was victimized like it was, uh, a hard life. When I moved from the school, I could, like, I enjoyed, I could, my well-being increased very much. So he's like, removal of negative or addition of positive. So with some citations, I think a lot, I had a lot, should say, negative adults around me throughout my childhood and upbringing. So when I became adult enough to be able to move out myself, and then they negative adults fell away. It's like negative, like it's in most cases like bad relationships to parents or something positive, additional positive. When you come to a community, when you feel like that you are accepted and you are a valuable, valuable person. So until this turning point uh, turning point, according to Benjamin, it was like more I endure, I have to survive. It's not, I, ha I, I cannot like escape from this. And then after this uh, turning point, it's like I, I can choose. I like, it's more like uh, there's agency. I have agency to, to, to do something. 
and he, he it's like based on this qualitative data he he made a huge i think it's uh, model and I would like to focus just on on some details like turning point and if you look at those like it's again it resembles that I presented a bit earlier meaningful job felt supported felt optimistic saw possibilities found reason to fight changed my mind and so on and current life I know what I need I know I am valuable I learned something that benefit me, others, and so on. They all, like, from these stories also that you can feel that it's resilient. Those people are resilient. They try to cope. Uh, the optimism for future. But what I, it's like, it's also a, like a black history. It's like a shadow that... I d did not get the right education, lost contact with my family, and probably the most uh, what I see is that struggle not to fall back into old patterns. And as a, I know I'm vulnerable, it's all, all the time, it's like, yeah, I'm on the way to be happy. I'm, I, my life is really much better when I compare to my um, older life, but it's struggle, it's, they are struggling not to fell back, so it's, and when I looked at that just uh, shortly, I will, uh, on no self-harm, uh, they did not self-harm, but we looked at positive tale, you know, so even if uh, this, um, this um, uh, sub subgroup is not like homogeneous, uh, no self-harm, so we looked just on, uh, on this positive tale, and and if you see this picture, as I showed, it's listening to these people, it was more or less like, you know, a, a, sh a small, wavy. Uh, and some comments, I had a very supportive parents. I had a number of good friends. I played football. I lived a happy life. Problem, hmm. I argue sometimes with my mom and my sister, but we used to figure out this. I never ruminate on the problem for a long time. So other things like that, happy here now, and gratitude also. So different paths to flourishing, I just, it's again, the main question probably we all have to, to raise, and I know that Antonella had this question when she thought to, to measure like happiness. What is happiness for people? What you, how you define yourself? Like how closely theoretical conceptualizations of flourishing reflect lay people's world understanding and what it is to be flourishing. And you know, it's like, I don't know it's, if it's possible to, to, to ask directly about flourishing in Italian. It's not possible to ask in, in Swedish. Because, uh, you know, it's like nobody understands, and this word is not a proper word to talk about lives, unfortunately. But when I looked at the data, uh, again, I, look, I really saw, like from these stories, I saw many key components that are included in, in this, in the different conceptualization of flourishing. So I think we are not so far, far away from this, the, conceptualization presented. So concluding remar remarks, different paths to flourishing, it matters regarding the prevalence rates of flourishing, what measures are used to assess, it, to assess it. And it's again, probably we, I know that it's not a new idea, but it's probably we really need a DSM for positive psychology. And you know, it's like, I think it's, it's all clinicians are more, agree more like what is um, how to diagnose depression or anxiety than we are and it's so so probably it's still we ha we need a committee for to develop this uh, this DSM manual uh, because I as I said it's it might be especially important for policy makers what are important pillars? What are, impo what are the most important key components? And then different paths to flourishing without a solid ground that should be built in during a childhood and adolescence, flourishing seems to be rather fragile. And the scars 
seem to be left not only on their arms, they are also in their souls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daiva. I am afraid we will not have time for questions because we are now too late, but uh, uh, Daiva will be here with us uh, today and uh, tomorrow as well in the morning. So in case you want to, to pose questions to her, she will be here. Uh, I, uh, just to summarize, I would like to say uh, um, one crucial thing. It is true that we have all these different measures of flourishing. Uh, they rely on different uh, theories. Um, one of them, like the Huppert and So measure, does exactly what positive psychology should not do, using uh, negative uh, items uh, as, uh, and uh, transforming them into it, their opposite. This is really what we should not do. Otherwise, uh, we are saying that mental health is the opposite of mental illness and we are not finding new indicators. Um, anyway, uh, I understand that the struggle is there. The important thing is, uh, I agree with Daiva, to use one measure, to use it in a reliable, statistically reliable way and then know that it is related to that measure. Uh, this is uh, a, a limitation in psychology, not just uh, uh, for flourishing, but for most measures. We are assuming, we, s we move from theories uh, and we verify them through self-reports. Uh, this is an issue. Uh, I work in the medical school. I'm permanently criticized because uh, I am told that our measures do not have any objective uh, evidence. It's not like collecting blood samples. Uh, but I think uh, using uh, uh, good methodology and appropriate statistics, even the, uh, I mean, even the neurological measures are, not, are just correlates. They are not causes of uh, uh, subjective indicators. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the only good way to work on it uh, is to rely on good uh, statistical instruments and methodologies. This is our, should be our strength. Thank you. I agree totally, and it's, it's very important. As I said, all these instruments that I showed, like really, they are valid and re reliable, but it's again, it's, it's uh, uh, as Antonella said, like how we define, you know, it's like you always can find measures like that, reliability like you know like that are consistent and uh, measures the same thing but what is this thing and uh, I, I totally agree with Antonella like this opposite opposite like um, depression and uh, it's it's uh, it's fortunately that this definition uh, was had the least agreement with other 